We all know that cost-benefit analysis rarely reflects all the living and non-living resources upon which humans depend and nature provides. These resources include the forests, grasslands, and coral reefs from which flow a steady stream of economically valuable ecosystem services. In Hawaii, examples of services include clean, abundant drinking water, carbon sequestration for climate mitigation, cultural sites, non-timber forest products, and the aesthetic and recreation values of open space. Efforts are currently underway in Hawaii through research, stakeholder working groups, and policy discussions to better understand the provision and value of ecosystem services and to incorporate this information into resource management decisions. Our goal with this symposium is both to introduce the concept of ecosystem services and to explore the opportunities and challenges of advancing the ecosystem service framework for conservation in Hawaii. Each of the five speakers will discuss ecosystem services that are currently undervalued in Hawaii from both biophysical and economic perspectives. They'll draw on successful global examples and local realities to discuss how each ecosystem service could be valued and coupled with conservation in Hawaii leading to win-win-win benefits for biodiversity, landowners, and communities. Dr. Gretchen Daly will begin the symposium with an overview of the ecosystem service approach, discussing innovative efforts already underway and opportunities here in Hawaii. The next two speakers will focus on specific services, carbon sequestration and emerging carbon markets, and hydrological services, the clean and abundant freshwater the, ecosystem the ecosystems can provide. We'll end with a, or I'm sorry, the final two speakers will address the financial and policy dimensions of ecosystem services. And then we will end with a panel discussion where the speakers will look forward to answering questions and engaging in discussion with all of you in the audience. Uh, one final note, we are very fortunate to have Representative Calvin Say, Speaker of the House, in the audience today. Uh, Kelvin Say was the sponsor of House um, Concurrent Resolution 200, which is a very important and relevant to this symposium, as it calls for new incentives for Malka land conservation with a particular focus on valuing the ecosystem services that Hawaii's Malka landowners often provide. Uh, so we're pl so pleased that he was able to join us today and that he may be able to offer his thoughts on the subject of this symposium during the discussion period. Okay, so I'd first like to introduce Gretchen Daly, Professor of Biological Sciences and Senior Fellow in the Woods Institute for the Environment at Stanford University. An ecologist by training, Gretchen's current efforts are focusing on making conservation economically attractive and commonplace. Her scientific research is on quantifying the conservation value of human-dominated landscapes both for biodiversity and society, and enhancing this value through innovative conservation finance. She works extensively with private landowners, economists, business people, and government to incorporate environmental issues into business practice and government policy. She and her lab group have ongoing projects here in Hawaii and at several sites around the world. Gretchen is also one of the three founders of the Natural Capital Project, an exciting new partnership between Stanford University, the Nature Conservancy, and World Wildlife Fund. The Natural Capital Project aspires to provide maps of ecosystem services, assess their value in economic and other terms, 
and for the first time on any significant scale, incorporate those values into decision making. Hawaii is one of the four primary demonstration sites for this project. Gretchen is going to launch this symposium by providing an overview of the ecosystem service approach to conservation, discussing projects that are already underway worldwide and exciting opportunities here in Hawaii. Aloha, and thank you so much for coming um, and for helping to light the way. It's a huge joy and honor to work in Hawaii, especially at this time. The challenges are so great, and yet the inspiration one finds here is also just tremendous. And um, it's just sort of, sort of the best part of my own life now, working together with you, many of you in the room and many others here, in reaching for a new kind of conservation, <clears throat> that kind of conservation that's a lot more linked to people and to human well-being, that's a lot more sort of pragmatic and maybe thoughtful about the economic and institutional dimensions of what we're all seeking, and much more unifying, hopefully, of people and of approaches through partnerships and shared vision than maybe conservation was in the past in order to reach beyond our traditional sort of base and engage people in all the sectors and with all the um, sort of <clears throat> viewpoints and values that we need to engage in order to be effective in our mission. So I feel we've got a promising future ahead and um, we'll lay out now kind of some of the backdrop against which we're working and around which we're coming together to try and forge a new path. Um, and that hopefully will set the stage for the next speakers who will get into a lot more detail on um, exactly what's going on in different dimensions of this work around the world and here in Hawaii. So the vision that we're all aspiring to, as Liba alluded to, is one in which conservation is mainstream, in which it's economically attractive, commonplace, and in which it sustains both nature and culture. It's much more linked to people. And this vision is one that people have come to from all parts, from the local communities, the private sector, um, leaders in government around the world. It recognizes ecosystems as capital assets. Um, <clears throat> that's sort of a point of entry. Capital assets that are worth, worthy of the care and attention that we give to other kinds of assets, whether physical capital, financial capital, human capital, and so on. Um, <clears throat> and this vision has often seemed like something kind of far away and out of reach and still quite blurry, way out there on the horizon. And I'd say today, more and more, <clears throat> it's coming into focus, and in particular on certain horizons, and in particular in key places here in Hawaii, where we're finding models of success and paths that are really working to align economic forces with conservation. So the three things I'd like to focus on as needs and challenges for all of us um, to address are the creation of new tools and use and honing of new tools in real places for valuing natural capital at scales that are relevant to decision makers. Second is developing and amplifying, sort of replicating models of success that align economic forces with conservation. And then third, obviously, building beyond those models through communication and other efforts to engage leaders worldwide in many different areas to replicate and scale these up. What I'd like to do initially, though, is just give a bit of background to make sure we're kind of all on the same page and then I'll jump into those three areas. So first, you know, what are ecosystem services? It's basically the suite of benefits that flow from healthy ecosystems to people, to society, and they can be classified in a whole bunch of ways. It's a little bit arbitrary. One way that I manage to keep in my head nicely is, is just to consider, first of all, production of goods, things that we trade regularly in the market economy and that do have some kind of value, however appropriate, attached to them. But second, and equally important and yet mostly hidden from the economy is um, our basic life support processes, things like climate stabilization, provision of abundant and clean fresh water, fire prevention, flood control, sedimentation control, and so on. Another class of services also often hidden from the economy, although deeply valued by certainly um, everybody in one way or another, the spiritual values we get from ecosystems, knowledge systems, 
our educational values, this inspiration and aesthetic beauty, social relations, our sense of place, recreation and ecotourism. And finally, there's a class of values when you consider how humbling it is to be studying nature and trying to understand human dependence and interactions, um, human dependence upon and interactions with it. It's just the, the preservation of options that we know so little about um, the numbers or types of species and ecosystems that we need to sustain in order to fulfill our lives and sustain societies into the future. So the biodiversity and resilience embodied in ecosystems is absolutely key in this regard. What do we have to build on? There's been a huge assessment that I know many of, of you are aware of and I'm sure contributed to in different ways, directly and indirectly. Uh, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment just concluded that summarizes and th synthesizes the consensus of the international scientific community. And it was very broad. A lot of people in the social sciences, economics, and other fields represented here, not just natural scientists. And the bottom line of this is not surprising that about 60% of different classes of ecosystem services are being degraded worldwide now. They are degraded seriously from earlier conditions. And the rate of degradation is accelerating in most cases. So the big question is, what do we do about this? Um, how can we build on this knowledge and make the leap that Mike Scott was referring to earlier from knowledge into actually doing? Well, the first thing we need to do that everybody recognizes as key is start thinking beyond the natural sciences, beyond our own maybe main comfort zone into how we could go about aligning economic forces and some of the other main forces that drive decision making and aligning those with conservation and moving from a model that we see prevailing today where agricultural production is um, rewarded economically whereas the provision of other classes of services typically isn't to a future in which the provision of all sorts of different services, these shown here as well as cultural and other services are, are rewarded economically and in other um, kinds of incentives. So this idea has really resonated it much more quickly than anybody kind of promoting it expected. And um, there's a lot of attention, a lot of hype, and a lot of demand on the part of decision makers for information that can be used in making local and, you know, relevant decisions in the near term today. You know, how do we bring these grand ideas down to earth and actually operationalize, this is our challenge, the ecosystem services framework? How do we make it practical so that we can bring the little tiny successes we have to scale? How do we make it straightforward and transparent so that it's easy for decision makers to replicate the models of success we have? And finally, how do we make it credible when values so often are um, subjective? They're inherently subjective in many senses. How do we develop a formal process for establishing at least minimum values of ecosystem service production and flow so that we have a credible system and one that can be sustained into the future. Um, so Liba mentioned the Natural Capital Project. That's one of many efforts now concurrently underway to try and make this framework operational. It's a partnership, as she said, of TNC, World Wildlife Fund, and Stanford University. These are sort of the organizing institutions. There are many, many other institutions <coughs> involved um, in our sites worldwide. We're working in in, among the four primary sites chosen because um, we believe through careful um, assessment that there's great promise in advancing this approach in these places are California, China, East Africa, and Hawaii. So there's a tremendous amount going on here and I bring this up, this partnership up just to emphasize how much um, people are looking to Hawaii as a place that really is showing the way. So. That's it, say, for background. What I'd like to do is jump into the kinds of new tools that we're developing and need to continue developing to make this reality. The first, um, and I'll mention that we're developing tools on a lot of different fronts, on the biophysical and economic front, more the policy and instit institutional front, and we're also working, we're just starting work. I should say the partnership is new. It's less than a year old but we're, we've been growing rapidly and we're starting work at the interface of conservation and poverty alleviation. Right now I'll just focus on the first um, tool that we're bringing forth, we hope, 
called INVEST for Integrated Valuation of Ecosystem Services and Trade-offs. And this is a tool that one uses in sort of three stages. The first is what, again, Mike Scott alluded to in his talk, just engaging with people on the land, in the places where yeah. decisions need, are being taken that affect conservation of our resources and you know, all the values that I alluded to earlier. So stakeholder input, um, defining what the key resources are, which are threatened and in what ways they're threatened, what the likely scenarios for the future are and how one might drive towards scenarios that help sustain or restore these values um, that we care about. So that's the first stage. The second stage is we've got this wonderful geek squad that has put together a series of models, biophysical and economic, to um, basically calculate production functions of how much of, of what types of services a given unit of an ecosystem provides in very specific terms on the ground. So in fact, this, this set of models is being packaged now by Esri and will hopefully become available as one of many Esri products for mapping and valuing ecosystem services. The third part then, the outputs can be expressed in both biophysical and in economic terms, because in many cases, um, the economics is a bit more subjective, and in some cases, it's not really appropriate or possible to ascribe an economic value to aspects of biodiversity and other cultural benefits and things. So we can express the outputs in a variety of terms that the user can define. Just to give you a little test case that's a bit um, outdated now, but where we first kind of applied these approaches was in the central coast ecoregion of California, extending from a bit north of San Francisco in the Bay Area down to Santa Barbara. And what we did was map out a suite of services as well as biodiversity. So here's the map for biodiversity. Here's that for carbon storage, the potential with high potential in today's landscape in red and, and low in green. And then for water provision, the same thing. And we did it for four other services. Um, this is just to show you how it looks. So going back, there's water provision, there's carbon storage, there's biodiversity, and this allows you to quantify the trade-offs associated with alternative sort of conservation objectives and projects and figure out where one can most strategically invest in order to sort of maximize the um, conservation of a suite of services beyond biodiversity. Um, what we're doing with INVEST, the new tool, is allowing a much more dynamic exploration of future scenarios where you look at how restoration might pay off for the provision of these different classes of services in the future. Um, and then with Kamehameha Schools, we're learning a lot and hoping to incorporate into INVEST a formal way of recognizing a suite of values that the conservation community, I think, cares a lot about, certainly pays a lot of lip service to, but has had trouble really um, formalizing in decision making. So cultural values of education, like native culture, community, we're working with them to try and understand better how we might make a, a formal um, sort of analysis part of invest in this general tool and way of thinking. Um, and moving on from there, since we have limited time here, just quickly to models of success. We are um, building on a lot of amazing deals that have been made in the past and that people are watching carefully today. Just to refresh you on some of these there's the famous New York City Catskills deal where the city faced a real worry over water quality coming out of the Catskills 100 miles to the north of the city and analyzed, as is typical in these cases, the relative payoff of investing in physical capital to ensure water quality. That would have cost a heck of a lot more than investing in watershed restoration, which they chose to do and are doing today. Um, another case, so that just shows in farmland and then um, areas purchased by uh, conservation groups where they're restoring like native wetlands, a lot of changes in management to help achieve water purification objectives. In Napa on flood control, a similar kind of analysis was done after years and years of devastating flooding. And the interesting thing here was that the natural capital approach was assessed as costing more than the physical capital approach, and yet people voted for the natural capital approach, and that was in anticipation of many other types of benefits that are difficult to capture in economic dollar terms. And indeed, many of these benefits are now being realized, and these photos are partly from 
a magazine called Wine Spectator. <laughs> so you can find in many um, you know, of the tourism and other magazines that talk about Napa and wine country, uh, this story being told. So it's so far considered a big success. And then I'm sure you've heard about the pioneering country, Costa Rica, whose government enacted 10 years ago now legislation that pays individual landowners about $20 per acre per year in an integrated package of um, paying for a suite of different ecosystem services, which is what the world is moving toward with Australia really being in the lead on this and David Brand, I imagine, will touch on that. Um, but the reason I allude to those old models is just to say that there are new ones coming up all the time. We've been worried about moving beyond the Catskills case and now we're moving so rapidly it's hard to keep pace. So the Nature Conservancy is um, developing new models and replicating some of these earlier examples now very rapidly in the U.S. and in other parts of the world, especially in Latin America. So to give an example, Quito, Ecuador set up a water fund to protect um, its biosphere reserve and um, that now is being replicated by many other capital and other large cities in Latin America and the targets um, range across a wide array of services as you can see here. And one of the big worries or questions has been whether these ecosystem service projects would really capture new dollars, new sources of revenue stream that were previously not available in conservation efforts. And this chart or uh, histogram just shows or bar graph shows that ecosystem service projects in blue do capture a, a much wider array and much more dollars. We're, we're just getting into this analysis. Um, than biodiversity projects do of revenue sources. So this effort is being led by a wonderful PhD student in our program, Becca Goldman, and will be publicly available sometime soon. So all these projects um, answer these questions, and I'm going to turn over um, the podium here in a minute to David Brand, who will get into the business dimensions of how one goes about addressing these questions, how one goes about on number three, engaging leaders, especially in the private sector, also in the public sector, to replicate and scale up these little successes we've had so far. Um, but Hawaii really is at the forefront in a lot of important ways in lighting the way, in providing not only the knowledge and tools as a foundation, but in exploring new finance and policy mechanisms for us through HCR 200 and the recent climate bill through um, really good communications with Kamehameha schools and other groups um, describing a future for Hawaii that is unifying and inspiring to a broad range of people and through partnership. So with that, thank you very much. Oh, who can the Hakala la ke kia manu ika ohu ika ohi ahamau me ho ahamau ita le o kale hua pane apane mai pahai ke ya mamue.